makes all the difference in the world whether or not Jesus lives in your heart. This is the seventh in a series of messages called The Real Thing. We're asking what is the real thing when it comes to following Christ? One of Jesus' disciples, John, answers this question in a little book called 1 John. He says the real thing, he, he says the way to identify the real follower of Christ is by looking for three things. A doctrinal test, belief in Jesus Christ, a moral test, obedience to Jesus Christ, and a social test, love for people. So, to summarize it, read this with me. The real thing is to believe Jesus, obey Jesus, and love people. I didn't hear anything. <laughs> Nothing up there? Let's try it again. The real thing is to believe Jesus, obey Jesus, and love people. Now at the end of chapter 3, the beginning of chapter 4, and the beginning of chapter 5, John addresses what Christians believe about Jesus. He tells us Jesus is the one true God. John challenges us not to be led into deception. Uh, John is worried about this because there's all kinds of uh, false teaching out there, false teachers who can lead us astray. Here are some of the most dangerous cults and religions that can deceive us today. Cults are generally considered, they're kind of offshoots of Christianity, so there's some likeness to it. Christian science, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, there are 7 million people. Mormons, International Churches of Christ, Scientology, uh, Holy Spirit for the Association of the Unification of World Christianity, Unitarian Universalism, New Age, the Nation of Islam, those are black Muslims. Uh, the, the world religions, uh, Islam, uh, 1.3 uh, billion adherents, Hinduism, 828 million, Buddhism, 350, Chi uh, Chinese folk religions, 400 million. Atheism has kind of a range, uh, depending how you want to count it. The pure atheist, if you add in agnostics, uh, communists, you know, there's, there's the range. And Judaism, 14 million. How do you identify false teaching? How do you differentiate between what is true and what is false? Well, let me answer that by asking another question. How do you tell the difference between counterfeit money and real money? Study counterfeit money? Study the difference between counterfeit money and real money? Or study real money? Well, the right answer, according to the Department of Treasury, is to study real money. In the same way, the best way to discover uh, something that's theologically off is to study the truth. Study what Jesus taught. Study the Bible. Now, if you're new to this whole God thing and wonder what followers of Christ believe or if you, you know, wonder what you believe about Jesus Christ, this message is for you. In our text today, John sets out three basic truths about Christ that Christians believe. If you understand these, you don't need to be a lightweight believer who stops believing in God whenever you hit a bump in the road. 
So I'm going to read a passage today from 1 John, 25 verses, kind of a long text. And I want, I want you to look for the key words. Key words usually are ones that are repeated. So in these verses, God is mentioned 44 times. Jesus Christ is mentioned 16 times. And the Spirit is mentioned 13 times. So believing the right things about Jesus has all to do with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And then there's one other phrase he uses six times. This is how you know. This is how you know you're the real thing. So let's stand in honor of God's word. We're going to uh, read starting at 1 John 3.19. This is how we know that we belong to the truth, the real thing, and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another, as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them, and this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world. And the world listens to them. We are from God. And whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out his commandments. In fact, this is, our, it, this is love for God to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood. Water refers probably to his baptism and blood to his death. Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify. The Spirit... That's the Holy Spirit. The water, his baptism when uh, the Spirit settled on him in the form of a dove. And God said, this is my son in whom I'm pleased. And then the blood when he died on the cross. And who would go that far to die for you and me in our sins than the Son of God? And the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony God has given us, eternal life. This life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have the real thing. You have eternal life. Lord Jesus, teach us today. You taught John. John now is written, inspired by your Holy Spirit. Teach us what we read and what we believe and how important it is to believe in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John spells out at least three essentials about Jesus that Christians believe. First, we believe Jesus Christ is the truth and only way to God. John quotes Jesus in his gospel, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says he's the truth and the only way to God the Father. Uh, John says, dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Over the last 50 years, we as a culture have abandoned belief in absolute truth. In a world where there is no such thing as absolute truth, people assume that all beliefs are equally valid. 
And it really doesn't matter what you believe. No one cares what you believe in our culture. People believe all kinds of things today. Teacher asked her students, what kind of religious objects do you have in your home? And uh, one girl said, well, we have a picture of a woman with a halo holding a baby. And my mom prays before that every morning. Another boy said, we have a brass uh, statue of a Chinese man s sitting with crossed legs. And my parents burn incense in front of him every day. Another boy piped up. He says, well, we have a platform uh, in our bathroom with numbers on it. And every morning my mom gets on it and then she screams, oh, my God. <laughs> John says it does matter what you believe. There are false prophets. There is false teaching and there is absolute truth. When John says in 1 John 4, 1, to test the spirits, he uses the strong Greek verb, dakamatsu, which means to examine carefully, think deeply about. Uh, John says uh, Christ followers are to use their minds to examine closely what people teach. We're to be readers and thinkers and analyzers of modern thought. John says don't believe everything you hear. We believe there's a God who created us and that God's finest and fullest revelation of himself is in his son, Jesus Christ. Purpose of life is to come to know our maker through salvation offered through Christ's death and resurrection. Whatever leads us to Christ is true. Whatever leads us away from him is false. There are many people today who say that they believe in Jesus, but they do not believe what Jesus taught about himself in the Bible or what the apostles taught about Jesus. No one who denies the Son, John says, has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. John says you can't have a relationship with the Father while denying his Son. There are many people today who say quite the opposite. They say it doesn't matter what you believe about Jesus. All beliefs lead to the same God. C.S. Lewis was really a prophet uh, of his time and before his time. Uh, he wrote the Narnia tales. I think three of them have been on the screen now. And uh, he wrote those in the 1940s and 1950s. And in uh, the last two Narnia tales, there's a scene where followers of Aslan, Aslan's the Christ figure, uh, meet the Calermines, uh, and they're led by Lord Shift, an ape who's an antichrist figure. And uh, one of the followers of Aslan is a sheep, in this case a little lamb, and he's, he's speaking, he says, uh, we follow Aslan, what do we have to do with the Calamines? You believe in a God named Tash. I don't even think there is a God named Tash. And even if there was, what would Aslan have to do with Tash? And the uh, Lord Shift uh, uh, gives a speech to, to, the, to the little lamb. Baby, he hissed, silly little bleeder, go home to your mother and drink milk. Just condescending. Uh, what do you understand of such things? But you others, listen. Tash is only another name for Aslan. All that old idea of us being right and the Calamans wrong is silly. We know better now. The Calamans use different words, but we all mean the same thing. Tash and Aslan are only two different names for you know who. But that's why there can never be any quarrel between them. Get that into your heads, you stupid brutes. Tash is Aslan. Aslan is Tash. Now, so many people believe today. God, Allah, Buddha, Jesus, it doesn't matter. They're all the same. They all lead to the same God. But that's not what Jesus taught. Jesus said, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. That's the same thing John says in 1 John. And this is the testimony God has given us eternal life. This life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. If you insist that all religions lead to the same God, you have to reject Jesus Christ and the Bible before they, could, they will not allow you that option. Last summer, I asked my assistant, Christine Langele, to give me a list of all the books written by Muslims who have become Christians. I was surprised when she gave me the list. They're like, there are over 24 uh, books on that list. And uh, so I ordered a couple of them. The most famous one is uh, F Seeking Al Allah, Finding Jesus. 
and I've probably quoted from him before, but this is uh, by Rifka Berry. She uh, grew up in Sri Lanka in a devout Muslim home. And when she was six, her older brother was flying an airplane. I don't know if it was a paper airplane or cardboard or metal, uh, but it blinded her eye. Well, girls in a Muslim society are not treated as well as boys. Boys are revered in a family. And when she lost her eyesight, she became handicapped, and she was like just scum to her parents from then on. Just, they hated her. They beat her. They hit her in the face. They pull her by the hair. It was just, just a horrible life. When she was nine, a distant uncle came to town for a while, and he molested her sexually. But instead of being angry with the uncle, the parents kind of like got angry with her. Now she's you know, defiled sexually, and they were even meaner to her, hated her even more. They were 11, they, they moved to New York City. And then when they were 13, they moved to Columbus, Ohio. There, they couldn't afford to send her to Muslim schools anymore, so she went to public schools, and she began to meet her first Christians. She was amazed how they would pray, just naturally, like they're talking you know, somebody seems so strange to what she experienced. And she began to wonder, is, is Islam true? But during these days, there were dark days for her because she had this horrible home life. And at school, she, she lived in a poor neighborhood, but she went to an upper middle class school. So it was a beautiful school, a lot of wealthy kids. And she'd eat alone every day. I mean, she was Muslim. She's different. She's blind in one eye. Nobody wanted to know her. So she'd go home miserable every day. And so she started cutting, trying to take her life. And one day she was doing that and she just fell on her knees and she said, God, if you're really there, I don't care your name, if it's Allah, Jesus, Buddha, whatever, if you quit hiding from me, if you show me who you are, I will follow you. She got up. Nothing happened. It seemed like God hadn't answered her prayer. But the very next day, she started bumping into a girl named Angela, a Korean girl, and it seemed like she was in just about all her classes, and they would see each other in the hall. And about a week later, uh, the algebra teacher uh, said, I want you guys to pair up to work on these, these problems. And Angela just walked right over to Rifka and said, would, you want to partner up? Sure. And then almost the next sentence, she sat down with her, and she blurted out, are you a Christian? Rifka says, yes, I am. You want to go to church with me sometime? Sure, I'll go. She thinks to herself, in 10 seconds, I've just told two lies. I'm going to get killed by my parents. But, you know, this Korean girl was very popular, very pretty, and she said she was not going to take a chance on losing out on this deal. So they went out for, like, lunch afterwards. This girl took her out, and she prayed, and Again, Rivka was amazed. She just prayed like she's talking to her mother. It's so different from what she's experienced. And, and then Rivka blurts out right after the prayer, I'm, I, I lied to you. I'm not a Christian. I'm a Muslim. And then she began to spill out her, her whole 13 years and things she'd never told anybody else. She said, my parents will kill me if they ever find out I go to your church. Angela says, don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out a way. And so her, her parents were, allowed her to go to Angela's house a couple times to study. About the third time she went to Angela's house to study, they didn't study, they went to church. She got there and she watched Angela round up all the girls and they were all Korean. And she could tell it was kind of like a pep talk. Hey, we got a non-believer here, up your game. And uh, they're looking over at her, at her with their almond eyes and shaking their heads. And, and we've got to keep her safe. Parents can't know, you know, all this. So then they went into worship. And they start to sing. And Rifka said, I felt like I was in heaven. Never have I sung like that before in my life. Then a guy got up to speak. And she didn't really understand what he said. I mean, she understood the English, but didn't really... But when he was done, he invited people to come forward if they wanted to become followers of Christ. And kids were going from all around her. And she just wanted to jump out of her shoes, but she was afraid. But then all of a sudden, she went. 
She went, went down the aisle, and she never made it. About halfway down, her legs just crumpled, and she burst into tears. All the emotion from her life. The counselor helped her, and she gave her life to Christ that night. The rest of the book is about her growing as a Christian and going to church and realizing, you know, i got to get out of my home. I, I will literally be killed if they discover that I've become a Christian. And so she, she runs away. But the hardest part about running away, and she puts this in her book, it's a, a little baby brother was born in their home, and she took care of him a lot. So she writes, To my precious baby brother, <clears throat> Mohammed Raja Berry. Raja was his name. I can only imagine the unanswered questions that may plague you. Why did the big sister you adore leave you and never come home again? My hope is that this book is a long letter explaining why. Although you may never understand my answer, my prayer is that the words within these pages allow your heart to heal. My prayer is that one day you will forgive me for the pain I have caused you. I left not because I did not love you enough. I left because I encountered a God who was worthy of forsaking all even the most prized little man in my life. If only you could peer through my dreams and see how I ache to hold you in my arms like I did so many years ago. Rivka came to believe that Jesus is the truth and the only way to God. Second, we believe Jesus Christ is fully God and fully human. John writes to Christians who are influenced by the a world largely molded by Greek thought. Platonic philosophy disdained physical existence but glorified the spiritual and ideological realm of ideas. When Christianity came on stage, there was a natural tendency to want to harmonize Christianity with the Greek philosophy of the day. And the Platonic contempt for physical existence and infatuation with things mystical led to a spiritualization of the Christian faith known as Gnosticism. The thinking that it would be unthinkable for the Holy Son of God to incarnate himself, incarnate himself in a sinful human body. So they alleged that Jesus was only a man and that the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus as a dove at his baptism and then left him before his death. So God never had to be, uh, deal with the mess of birth and death. This denial that the divine Son of God was born as a human being is what John is combating in this little letter. Now you can better understand what John means in 1 John 4, 2. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. Then John goes on in chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, Son of God, is born of God. Christ's follower also believes Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. He continues in verse 5. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. To be a Christian, you can't believe anything you want about Jesus. You believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he incarnate, incarnated himself in a human body. Tell me what you believe about Jesus Christ, and I'll tell you whether or not you're a Christian. Karl Barth said, tell me how it stands with your Christology, and I'll tell you who you are. Christians believe that Jesus is fully God and fully human. Best way to evaluate any teaching or religious movement is to ask, what do you teach about Jesus Christ? But you have to be discerning. Because many of these religions and cults that I already read you will say, oh, we believe in Jesus. Some will even say we believe he's the son of God. But they don't believe he's the only son of God and the only way to God. Third, we believe Jesus Christ gives us the Holy Spirit to dwell in us and is greater than all other powers in the world. Christians believe that when they put their faith in Jesus Christ, Christ gives the Holy Spirit to live in them. The Holy Spirit is the seal, the assurance that we are the real thing, that we really know God. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them, and this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. When I went to graduate school, I chose my courses mostly by, not by title, but by the professor. I wanted to take from the best professors on campus. 
One of my favorite professors was John Stott, the pastor of All Souls Church in London. When he would teach a, a passage of the Bible, he had a way of explaining it so that it made sense. Uh, so I took him to dinner a lot of times, lunch. We talked a lot, and uh, he took an interest in me, saw potential in me, so he invited Jory and me to come to London uh, for a one-year internship. Ultimately, we decided not to go, but if we had gone, I would have had private Bible lessons from him every day. That's precisely what God offers us with the Holy Spirit. If you've given your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in you. When you open the Bible, you have the master teacher who inspired the entire Bible living inside you to help you understand it. A lot of times people say, ah, I don't understand the Bible. I open it up, big words, a lot of, ah. You have the best teacher in you. You don't need me standing over you for you to understand the Bible. You just ask God by the Holy Spirit to help you understand it. Every time you open the Bible or use our journal or some other study that you use, before you start, say, God, help me understand this by your Holy Spirit to understand what I'm reading. Some people ask why God, uh, John doesn't say more about the Holy Spirit. For example, 1 John 1, 3, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Why doesn't he mention the Holy Spirit? I mean, that seems odd. When you become a Christian, it's the Holy Spirit who comes and dwells in you. Why does he only mention the Father and the Son? Well, John is like all the other writers in the New Testament. They speak more about God the Father and God Christ the Son than they do about the Holy Spirit. And when they do speak about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is very much a behind-the-scenes member of the Trinity. Whenever you look at the Holy Spirit, he's pointing at Jesus. The Holy Spirit not only helps us understand the Bible and assures us that we are real Christians, but he gives us the strength to overcome all powers and challenges we face. And one of the most famous verses in 1 John John says, you dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The truth that the Holy Spirit is greater than the devil is good news. What would it matter if Jesus is the Son of God and if the Holy Spirit dwells in us if we had no power over Satan or our lower nature? What difference would it make? But the good news of the gospel is not just that Jesus loves us but that he is all-powerful. The gospel is powerful. When we receive Christ into our lives, he gives us victory over our old ways, gives us victory over anger, bitterness, envy, hatred, gossip, pornography, lust, addictions, or whatever puts us in bondage. Whatever you face that tears you down and defeats you, Christ gives you power to overcome. That's the good news. Whatever situation we face, if we cry out to Jesus, he will help us face it. September 9th, 2005, Jory and our son Luke were driving in Kenya, an old road. It was raining, a slippery road, and they hit a pothole. And their car, you know, creened across the road, over the embankment, steep hill, and they were headed toward three giant trees. Both of them thought to themselves, this is it. My life will end today. Jory just had time to cry out, Lord, save us. And just then, she could feel the car being literally moved by Jesus or by an angel. And it was set down in some small bushes, smaller trees. And they survived. Both of them, you know, Luke came out of the car, Jesus saved us. Jory's thinking, not so much. He broke her back. She was in the back seat. But he did save them. If we cry out to him in a moment of need, he will either deliver us or do what he thinks best for us. In the verses we looked at today, John lays out three great truths Christ's followers believe. Jesus is the truth and only way to God. Jesus is fully God and fully human, and Jesus is greater than all other powers in the world. We believe Jesus is the Son of God and Savior of the world. He is the one true God, or he is the one who can take us to the one true God. 
If you believe Jesus is the one true God, you don't need to be a lightweight believer, but can share the good news of Jesus with people around you, your friends and family members. But how do we get people to let go of the false beliefs they're clinging on to and put their faith in Jesus? We have a dog named Shiloh and a cat named Oreo. We keep Shiloh in a pen and uh, we take him out for walks each day and sometimes just let him roam free for a while. But eventually, got to get him back to his pen and often he's playing with a soccer ball. He's quite a soccer ball player. Grabs it in his mouth or tennis ball and if you try to get those away from him, he probably won't succeed. So we've kind of learned sometimes he knows pen time means back to imprisonment and he doesn't want that. So it can be a a job. So we've kind of learned that meat works. Come on, Shiloh, and come back in here, you get this meat, and then he'll drop his soccer ball and come into his pen. It doesn't always work. One time he was gone, and I went down to the neighbors to try to find him, and I had a little bag of meat in my hand. I'm going, Shiloh, come on. You know, real good control I have, and uh, backing my way up to the pen, and he just jumped up and grabbed the whole bag and so then he had everything, I had nothing. The way to reach people for Christ, don't waste your time trying to destroy or yank wrong beliefs away from them. Doesn't work with Shiloh, it's not going to work with your friend either. That makes them resist all the more. Instead, offer them the truth. Give them a message with some meat on it. Tell them about a time that Jesus saved you from a near life-ending event. Tell them how Jesus has given you a heart of forgiveness for somebody who really hurts you deeply. Tell them how Jesus has helped you to love your husband or your wife or your son or daughter or mother or father. That's the best way to win people to Christ and from ways that are false is to share with them the good news of what Jesus has done in your life. Lord Jesus, thank you for teaching us through this, these words of 1 John. I want to give you a moment to respond now. If you've never given your life to Christ, this would be a great time. Just say, Jesus, I, I'm, I hear it. I believe you're the Son of God, Savior of the world. I want you in my life. Would you come in? If you've already committed your life, this would be a good time to recommit to him what you believe. Uh, not be a lightweight believer anymore, but say, this is what I believe, and just kind of repeat it back to him. So everybody, would you pray? I'll give you about a minute. Lord Jesus, thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you that you are the one true God and the one who leads us to God the Father. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, would you take out your program, The Real Thing? Inside is a thing that says communication card, and we really 